All right, we are up to the third chapter in the book of James. And we start out with the first 12 verses. And in the first 12 verses, James speaks of taming the tongue. I think you'll find this interesting. Are you ready? Beginning at verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. I'm going to stop for a minute. I'm going to go ahead and articulate on this a little bit real quick. Because notice that James identifies himself as a master. You say, well, does he really? Yes, he does. Look at what he writes. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So what he is doing is he is articulating the fact that ministry is most certainly in a higher place of authority, number one, but a higher place of responsibility, number two. He said, yeah, you're a master. You're, you are in charge at some level in matters pertaining to the church of God. However, he said, don't have a church full of people, everybody wanting to be the top dog. This is one reason I've said so many times, when the Lord called me to preach, literally, I'm not joking, especially as I got older and I understood my calling, I was afraid. Not terrified afraid, but respectfully afraid. Because I recognized, Jack, that God had called me to a great responsibility. Wasn't all about glamour. Wasn't all about, oh, you get to be the top dog in a church. You know, you get to be the hot shot. That's not what I saw when I looked at ministry. When I looked at ministry, when I looked at my pastors, I saw authority, God-given, God-called authority. But I also saw a tremendous responsibility that these men had. And that is what James is speaking of here. He starts out admonishing. I'll tell you, there is a problem. I'm going to try to say this as genteelly as I can. There is a problem in many ethnic churches in America. Everybody and their brother has to have a position. Everybody and their brother has to have a title. You don't have a single person in the church called brother or sister. It's elder, it's deacon, it's pastor, it's bishop, it's apostle, it's this, it's prophet, it's all these titles. And what people do not realize is when you adopt that title, you are going to stand before God and you will answer as an apostle. You will answer as a bishop. You will answer as a pastor. You will answer as a prophet. See, people like to play games with words. They like to play games with titles. Everybody wants to elevate their self-esteem with titles. And this is a major problem in the church world today. Major problem. Good God, I've gone into churches, little tiny churches, that are little storefront churches about maybe this big, that maybe have 50 or 60 people, and the pastor, oh, he can't be satisfied being pastor so-and-so. No, no, he's got to be apostle so-and-so. What in the world qualifies you as an apostle? What in the world makes you even think in the loftiest thoughts in your brain that you're an apostle? How do you think for one minute you stand on the same ground in the same playing field as Paul and Peter and James and John and Matthew and Mark? I'm sorry, I don't see it. But there are men in today's world by the hundreds and thousands who think nothing of adopting these titles. And yet I find it interesting that in the book of Revelation, the Lord says, you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not. Uh -huh. So not everybody who calls himself an apostle, my friend, 
is in fact and indeed an apostle. And we need to be careful because the Lord literally praises the church that puts them to the test and knows the difference. He said, those of you that have tried these men who say they're apostles, but they're not, he has words of praise for that church. He has words of praise for those people because they are operating in the realms of discernment. See, too many people in the church world, the reason these preachers get away with all this title grabbing is because people in the church, if I apply a title to myself, all of a sudden people think I am whatever I'm calling myself. When I was ordained in 1994, there's a ministry in Pennsylvania. I was pastoring a little work in Pennsylvania. Jason and I were there. And this pastor... Uh, his ministry was set up, they had once been UPC and had gone independent, and they were set up to ordain ministers. And he came to me and said, Brother, you have a wonderful, powerful, anointed ministry. And he said, I know and you know that God doesn't need a paper on the wall saying you're ordained to preach. He said, but... In many principalities, in many townships and cities and states, uh, if you can, if you are to legally be able to perform a wedding, for instance, you have to have ordination proof of ordination. You have to prove you're an ordained minister. He said, so although that certificate we know doesn't mean anything to God, because God knows who he's ordained. Because it's God that ordains, not men. He said, even though we know that, it would be ridiculous for a man with... This is what Brother McCoy told me. He said, it would be ridiculous for a man with your ministry not to be able to perform a wedding because you don't have this piece of paper on your wall. He said, our church is uh, set up. Our, our, uh, our uh, constitution is set up so that we can set forth and ordain ministers. He said, I would like to ordain you. It would be my privilege to ordain you. And I agreed. I said, okay, fine. Well, they had the ordination service. And during the ordination service, the brother got up in front of, there were several people from his church there, and of course people from my church. And it was a little combined service. Had a very nice service. There was a wonderful spirit there. The Lord was there in a wonderful way. And he articulated how, in his experience, and in his knowing me for, at that point, you know, nearly a year, he said, I feel confident saying that Brother Charles exemplifies the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And I sat there. And I thought to myself, brother, please do not try to attach the term apostle to me. I'm so far from being an apostle in any good thing, as far as I'm concerned. I said, no, I'm, I'm hardly, I'm not even close to being an apostle. Don't, don't apply that, because he was trying, literally, he said, I feel like this man embodies all five of these offices, Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Pastor, Teacher. I used to have the service on video, and it, years ago I misplaced it, and I keep praying that one day it'll resurface somewhere, but so far it hasn't. And anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, I am not so hungry for recognition, I am not so hungry to have my self-esteem bolstered by position, by titles, that I am even willing to allow someone else to label me an apostle. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? Because the minute that I embrace that, I will answer for that. You follow what I'm telling you? James said, be not many masters. You remember the old saying, that you said an old song years ago, said there's too many cheats and not enough Indians around this place. Remember? And 
in the church world there are many people who clamor to be a chief and I'm going to tell you something if you have to work toward it and work for it you don't belong there the word of God tells us humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up if God wants you elevated God will elevate you the fact that you struggle and strive and work toward elevation tells me right there that you have no business being on the elevator. You don't even belong on the escalator. You probably hardly belong in the church door. But there, you know, but this is a very serious problem, folks, in the church world today. It is a very serious problem. God called me, for instance, when I was a young person. He told me, I asked him, I said, Lord, what kind of ministry will I have? Because I was curious. I was just a teenager, and I said, Lord, what kind of ministry? Everybody has a different type of ministry. Some have teaching ministry. Some have... Uh, evangelistic ministry. You know, I said, Lord, what kind of ministry? I never expected the answer I got. And he spoke back to me. Booby, can you fix the fan in the back, please? He spoke back to me and he said, you will have a prophetic ministry. And I said, a prophetic ministry? Woohoo! God's going to use me in prophecy. I'm going to be in church. My eyes are going to roll into the back of my head. I'm going to talk in tongues a little, and I'm going to prophesy, Thus saith the Lord, glory to God, hallelujah. Growing up in the assemblies, that's what I thought prophetic ministry was. Boy, could I have not been any more wrong. Prophesying and being a prophet are not one and the same. The Word of God speaks in the book of Acts, of individuals and the word of God says and they prophesied it does not say they were prophets oh my there are those when they received the gift of the Holy Ghost the word of God said they spake with tongues and prophesied that was under a temporal anointing they did it for that moment in time that did not make them prophets. When God calls you to a prophetic ministry, it's a whole brand new level, baby. It's a whole new place. And the way that he described it to me, because I didn't really know, like I said, I thought it meant prophesying in the gifts of the Spirit sense of prophesying, okay? That's not what it meant. He said, no, <laughs> let me clarify for you. You're going to say what I tell you to say. And it don't matter who likes it or who don't like it. He said, your relationship with me is going to be such that I can tell you my heart. And you will speak it. Because I've told you to speak it. That's why when I preach, and when I teach, and when I talk, I don't care what other preachers have told you. I don't care what others have, how they have translated, or how they have represented this. If, I, if the Spirit of the Lord has spoken to me, I tell you what God showed me. And I could care less what you've heard, I could care less how it was taught to you before, what they had to say, that doesn't matter. Because, listen, I literally walk, I try to walk, let me rephrase that, I try to walk every day, all day, with communication with the Lord. And if God's got something to say, that's one reason why I speak often when I preach of problems in the church world. That's prophetic ministry. God has revealed to me His heart. These are things God has shown me that are problematic, that don't belong there, that shouldn't be there. People, oh, he just crabby old goat. All he wants to do is crab about that. No, I don't want to crab. Believe me, I would love to be able to come out here perky and peppy every time. 
But when the Spirit of the Lord has shown me something and God has commanded me to speak, I have no choice. I have no choice. I couldn't hold it back if I wanted to. Who was it? Jeremiah said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. You have no idea. I've tried to preach sometimes, and you'll see me. I'll stand there and say, I'm trying not to say this. I don't want to say it for real, you know, because I know somebody's going to get mad at me. I know somebody's going to storm out of the church. I know somebody's going to quit our church the minute I say this. But I've got to say it. Amen. I've got to. And I wind up, here it comes. I've got to say it. I say all that to say this. If God's called you in fact and in deed to any of the fivefold ministry offices, according to James, you will stand accountable for that office. And if you are fool enough to try to step into it yourself, if you're full enough in your carnality, let's call a spade a spade. If you're full enough in your carnality to try to aspire to an office that God has not called you to, honey, I got news for you. You will answer for that. That's powerful. People do not respect the authority of ministry in the world today. Most churches, the reason they don't respect it, we'll hear. Uh, again, this is prophetic. What I'm saying right now is prophetic. I'm not sitting here, you know, but it is prophetic. The problem, the reason most churches today do not respect the authority of ministry is because, number one, half the preachers shouldn't be there. And secondly, even those that are God called and God anointed are not walking in the authority that they have been given by God. Amen. They cower, they cow down, they let things go on in the church that ought not to be going on. And God has given them the authority as the pastor to set these matters right to deal with these issues, to address these issues. But Jack, they don't. I know some men of God that I love dearly. I honestly do. I admire them. I respect them. I love them. I've talked about this before. But they are the weakest pastors I've ever laid eyes on in my life. And there are demons running loose in their church. People come in, they pray through, they get the Holy Ghost, they're in the altar, they have an experience with God, they're in the church three months. And one or two of these lunatics who have these religious spirits, mother takes them right out the door. I, I, could, I could name a church right now in East Texas that I'm speaking of specifically. They have more backsliders from their church outside in the community then they have people serving the Lord actively inside on the pew and it's because a pastor is not walking in the authority that God has given him as a pastor James said be not many masters knowing that we shall you're a master baby not a master in the sense of slave master. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't mix it up. Let me give you a better understanding of what type of master ministry is supposed to be. You ever heard of a master plumber? You ever heard of a master carpenter? Have you ever heard of a master electrician? You know what a master electrician is? You know what a master plumber is? That is someone who has proven and established that they know their discipline so well that basically there's not anything they don't know in terms of now because he knows about plumbing don't mean he knows about electricity because he knows about electricity don't mean he knows how to build a house like a carpenter but he knows his discipline he's mastered that discipline well a pastor 
and those in ministry, oh, hallelujah, Woo, this gets good, and we're just in verse 1, is one who is supposed to have mastered the discipline to which they have been called. When I was in the Church of God, we had a, a inter internship program. And in the internship program, you served under a pastor. And the, the term they used for the pastor that the intern was under was your master pastor. They did not mean the intern was a slave. They didn't mean, you know, the intern was had to do whatever this guy said. But the idea was, this guy knows his business. He's been in this longer than you have. He's done this longer than you have. He's learned. He's earned his stripes. You know, he's earned his way uh, to, the, to the title master. He's mastered his office. And therefore, as a master, he's in a position then to teach you. Amen. You don't want somebody teaching you that hadn't mastered. That's right. That's why they have in university a master's degree. And people are referred to as a master of theology or a master of, uh, of uh, literature or what have you. Whatever their degree is, they're a master in that area. So I don't want people to run away from this term, master, as though it's something awful. That's not what James is saying. But it's so important to understand today that God equips those whom He calls. And if He hasn't called you, don't expect Him to equip you. God does not, oh hallelujah, God doesn't put Saul's armor on David. Hallelujah, boy it is. <laughs> God does not put Saul's armor on David. Right. If God has not called you, honey, don't think you're going to force his hand and he's going to go ahead and equip you for ministry because after all, you just jumped out there and started a church. It does not work that way. It does not work that way. I have seen more souls damaged by people in ministry who have no business in ministry. Amen. I have an uncle... And I, I honestly, I love the guy, bless his heart. But he has long had very deep-seated self-esteem issues. And in order to feel like somebody, he got it in his head that he was supposed to be a minister. And he's never tried to pastor a church. But he has tried to set up at different times these parachurch type ministries. You know, ministries outside of the church that kind of work with the church, you know. And one evening, a young man that I grew up with, best friends with my uncle Philip, they went to school together their whole lives. This young man became very depressed and upset. He was in love with this young lady, and this young lady did not return his affections. And this poor young man, all his life, had a very terrible stutter. And it was very hard for him to speak, especially if he got excited, you know. <laughs> you know, and it, it, he couldn't hardly get a phrase out. Well, my uncle being a minister... Tony went to him and he was so upset and so depressed and so upset and he spoke of hurting himself he spoke of not wanting to live any longer not wanting to go through life he was lonely, he was hurting, blah 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 and my uncle, oh Tony quit talking like that just go home and get some sleep and you'll feel better tomorrow. Just go home and get some sleep. This is a minister. See, a real minister would have been in tune with the leading of the Holy Ghost. And would have recognized, uh-oh, there's real trouble here. 
You don't want to tell this boy, go home, get in your car, go home by yourself. And you'll, no, there, something more needs to be addressed here. Well, Tony finally left my uncle, went out to the car in my uncle's driveway, and in my uncle's driveway, took a gun and blew his head off. Shot his own head right off his shoulders. In my uncle's driveway. He went to my uncle because my uncle called himself a minister. That's what he told him when he went there. That should never have happened. That should never have happened. And that young man may very well tonight be in hell for the sake of a so-called minister. Honey, he will answer for that. You do not assume a title. You do not assume a position because it pads your ego. And then think that you will not answer for, as one who occupies that office. The only difference is one who's been called to that office, God will equip for the job. You're on your own. So just imagine what you're going to have to answer for when you face God in the judgment. God help you. Folks, this is serious business today. The last thing, I, I'll never forget when the Lord called me to start my first church. I was 18 years old. I was going through the internship in the Church of God. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to start a church here in the valley. Now this is the, the part of Connecticut where I grew up. It's pretty rural. You've got a series of towns that run down through this valley, the Naugatuck Valley. And the Lord said, I want you to start a holiness church here in the valley. Well, I come from Texas and Brother Gillum's church, and I was believing in long hair and long skirts and all that. And honey, they had a lot of churches like that in Connecticut. The few little rat tat UPCs they have, I promise you right now, they don't have they don't have any mega churches like that in, in Connecticut. It's a very different environment spiritually, okay? When the Lord spoke to me, I called my overseer and I said, Brother Overseer, Brother Chandler, do you have a pastor that you can send to the valley? and I will help him start a church. I didn't want to do it. I was terrified. Why? Because I had no faith? No. I feared God. I, Mother, I thought, dear Jesus, I'm only 18 years old. What am I going to do with souls in my hands? What am I going to do with people making heaven or hell based on what comes out of my mouth? And not only what comes out of my mouth, but what comes in response to the way I live my life, whether or not I can live this example. I'll never forget Brother Gillum telling me one time about holiness and about standards, because I was so gung-ho on him when I first come into it, you know. And Brother Gillum said to me one time, he said, Chuck, the best way in the world to teach standards is to live them. He said, you don't have to get in a pulpit and preach clothesline. Live them. Live them. He said, if you'll live them, the people will follow. That's right. Amen. And I did, and they did. Yes, amen. So now, I was terrified. I kept telling Brother Chandler, can you send a preacher? He'd say, Brother Chuck, we don't have anybody. We don't have any. He said, this isn't the South, son, where every church has got 30 preachers sitting in the pew. He said, this is the Northeast. He said, we literally have a couple of congregations that don't even have a pastor because there ain't nobody wants to come up here and pastor in New England. So we don't have a surplus of ministers. Well, finally, after my internship, the Lord spoke to me one day and He said, I told you to start a church. I didn't tell you to get a preacher and do... I told you to start a church. And I called Brother Chandler and I said, Brother Chandler, the Lord has spoken to me and He wants me to start this church. And Brother Chandler, here I'm 18 years old. And boy, when I look back, holy Moses, 
18 years old. I didn't know my eardrum from a hole in the clouds. You know, I didn't. What did I know about anything? What did I know about living this thing? I'm being honest. At 18, what did I know about any of that? But Jack, I didn't run into that job either. I did not run into it. I said, the Lord told me to start. Brother Chandler said, well, brother, why don't you go ahead and start you a home Bible study? Why don't you go ahead and start you a home prayer meeting? And I said, okay, uh, I have a little problem with that. He said, what's the problem? I said, the Lord told me what to do and how to do it. He said, well, what did he tell you? I said, he told me to find a meeting place, print up flyers, go around the community, talk to people, let them know we're starting a church and this will be our first service on this Sunday. Oh, no, 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 brother, no, 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 no. We have never started a church like that in the history of the church of God. That is not how you start a church, brother. Let me help you understand. You need to start a home Bible study. It'll probably take you four or five years, but you'll eventually get up to eight or ten people. And then when you get that many people coming faithfully and being support, then you go find your little meeting space, and then you do And he literally was telling me, I said, brother, that's not what the Lord told me to do. Well, I can tell you right now, I've been in the church of God 60 years, and I ain't never seen a church start the way you're talking, brother. And he admitted later, when he organized us officially as a church of God congregation, he admitted later that he thought I was a young man with a lot of zeal and very little wisdom. And that I was jumping the gun, and you know, in the flesh, and very... That's what he saw when he heard me talking. So finally I said to him, I said, all right, Brother Chandler, here's the deal. The Lord told me what He wants me to do, and He told me how He wants me to do it. Now you can either get behind me or get out of my way. Which one do you want? You remember Brother Chandler? And uh, he said, Brother, we're behind you. You just go on ahead, we're behind you. I finally found a little old meeting space on the third floor of a walk-up building. No elevators. Nearly 30 stairs per, fl per flight because the ceilings were so high in this building that you had to walk 30 stairs to get up to the next level. The Rado building in Naugata. Used to be an old Oddfellas building. The third floor was dusty as all murder. The highway was raised and ran right outside the windows. Dust was so thick on the floor, it looked like carpeting, literally. I went in before the first service, you know, and I mopped and cleaned. And literally, I went back an hour later, it looked like it did before I cleaned. Literally. It was that old. The windows, when I tried to put the window up a little bit, I pulled the wood right up out of the sash. Tried to move the curtain and the curtain crumbled in my hand. It hadn't been used and literally had not been used. That whole third floor had not been used in about 40 or 50 years. So the material that the curtains were made of literally just sat in the sun. No movement to keep them pliable and they never moved. And literally when I went to touch them, it, they literally crumbled in my hand. And this is where I was able to fight to start our first meeting. Went around the community, talked to people. Some young people, a young couple had started a Bible, uh, a Bible bookstore in Seymour, Connecticut. And I talked to them and they said, we go to a little home Bible study. Some of us have kind of, they had been going to Assembly of God churches and they kind of become upset with the way things were going in the Assemblies of God and they quit going. He said, and what we do is we get together on Friday night and have a home Bible study in these folks' house. He said, that probably about ten or so of us. He said, why don't you come tell everybody about your church, what you're doing? This was the Friday night before I had scheduled to start my first service that following Sunday. Two days before we're going to have my first service. I go to this home Bible study. I'm 18 years old. Everybody always teases me to this day 
Because anybody who knows me knows that I don't do anything without being real enthusiastic and just full blown into it. Well, I was that way, you know, I'm all on fire, man. I can't wait. Come start an old time Pentecostal church. Hallelujah, glory. We're going to shout a little. We're going to run the house. We're going to have church. God's going to heal. God's going to deliver. People be filled with the Holy Ghost. I haven't even asked God for the Holy Ghost. And you know, and I'm all on fire. Well, Sunday morning comes. I go upstairs into this old building and I'm sitting there and 11 o'clock rolls around and not a soul to be seen. Not a soul. Not one. I got down next to the bench that I set up as something of an altar and I had to put a blanket that I folded in half in front of it so I wouldn't get dust all over my clothes. And I knelt down at that bench and I began to pray. I said, Lord, you told me to start this church. You told me how to start it. I said, hey, don't you dare let me sit here in this building all by myself today. I asked you when to start it. I asked you how to start it. I didn't leave you out of any detail. I said, don't you dare leave me high and dry sit here tonight, all, today all by myself. And as I sit there praying, Mother, I begin to hear it scuffling out in the hallway. And I begin to hear Shoes coming up the stairs. Literally, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was praying and I heard this. And I heard voices. All of a sudden, I kept praying. All of a sudden, I kind of peeked around my shoulder and by God, there were 12 people sitting in the seats. Eight of them came from that Bible study that I had met just the Friday night before. We had church, the end of the service, eight people, minus two that were in the Bible study the Friday night before did not come up, but six of them plus two of the others did and said, would you be our full-time pastor? My first service. I'm making a point, and it's not to worship Pastor Charles. I'm making a point. So will you be our first time, our full-time pastor? We'll support you. You don't have to work a job. We want you to do this full-time. We don't want your attention to be divided. We want you to. Wow. I'm 18 years old. Amen. I called Brother Chandler on the phone. Brother Chandler, we had our first service today. Well, brother, you know, you've got to expect some disappointment so long, but he was all geared up, just knew I flopped. I said, oh, no. I said, we did pretty well. He said, really? I said, yeah. He said, well, how many people did you have? I said, well, could me, 13. 13 people, my God, hallelujah, glory to well, hallelujah, and he's getting happy on the other end of the phone. Then he stops, he said, how much did you collect in the offering? Said, $93. $93 from 13 people on your first service. Oh, hallelujah, glory to God. Woo! And he's getting happy on that in the phone. <laughs> now my mother knew Brother Chandler. And you can picture him doing this. <laughs> I said, Brother, wait a minute. I got something else I need to tell you. I said, uh, after the service, eight of them came up to me. Now, bear in mind, two of these were children. Out of the 13 of us, two of them were children. Eight of the remaining ten came up and asked me if I would be their full-time pastor. I won't even try to imitate his joy. That man shouted all over heaven, and I mean he shouted and danced and did a jig. He was so thrilled. He said, I can't believe this. I can't believe why we never had a church start like this in the history of the church of God. Five months later, five months later, we organized as an official congregation in the Church of God from conception. 
had nearly 50 people in attendance that Sunday, including my own father. Had a move of God like nothing you've ever seen in your life. Brother and Sister Chandler came, of course, because they're the overseer. And when he did the, ordina the uh, organization service, he said, I thought this young man was just ahead of himself. I didn't think he'd really heard from God, to be honest with you. He said, I didn't really think he'd heard from God. I didn't really think. He said, but, and he bawled like a baby throughout this whole service. Brother Chandler did. Cried throughout the whole service. He said, but looking at this crowd today, we have 12 people that wanted to officially become members of the Church of God because you needed at least 8 or 10 to become an official congregant. Had 12. Had little band, had people playing instruments, had 40 or 50 people there, including Grandma Bell, Grandma Picanso, Leslie was there that day. Owen was there. And he said, and seeing how God moved in this place, he said, honey, his, he and his wife were a few minutes late driving up to the church. And when they got to the door, we were already in the altars praying because we started every service in the altar like we ought to. He said, I opened the door for my wife and we heard the prayers. We just heard everybody praying and that spirit of intercession. He said, and brother, a wind came out of that door and blew my wife's hair back. He said, it couldn't do much with mine because he was kind of set up like old brother. <laughs> he didn't have but a couple little wisps here on the side. He said, the wind couldn't do much with my hair. He said, but my wife's hair literally blew back. And she looked at me and said, dear God, are we going to have church today? And we did. I made a point. Listen to my point. I feared God and I, I was so respectful of the responsibility that I was stepping into. And I knew that 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 God had called me. I knew that 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 God had told me to start this church. I knew that I knew that I knew that God told me how to do it. And I still tiptoed into it. I didn't run into it. Because I understood what James says. We shall receive the greater condemnation. I understood that. If I had not been right in terms of the call, if I had not been right in terms of the direction, if I had not been right in terms of the how and the when and the where, if I had not been in tune with God, honey, what happened would not have happened. That's right. Do you know what I found out later? The Lord had spoken in this home Bible study several months earlier in a prophecy. And He told the people that came together for this home Bible study, I'm sending you a pastor. He's a young man. And he is going to tell you things you've never heard before. And when I walked into that Bible study that Friday night, the reason they showed up on Sunday morning is they said, could it be? That's why they come up to me and said, we want to support you full time. God had already, oh hallelujah, He had already set up a church. There was already a church there. All God wanted the preacher to do was get in place to pastor it. That's right, amen. You don't have to fight for position. Amen. When God has called you, you don't have to struggle for elevation when God has called you. God will elevate you. God will lift you up. I sometimes regret the fact that God gave me such great success early in my ministry, literally, because it has been a curse to me since I've been in affirming ministry. Things in this line of ministry work so completely the opposite to everything I'm used to. Honey, I got news for you. My first church, if we'd have had a building like this available to us, dear Jesus, 
Jack, we'd have been here for probably four months before we'd have to move to a bigger building. We went through buildings in that first church, my God. And by the time I told Brother Overseer Chandler, I told him that first phone call when I told him, I said, the Lord told me to start church. One of the things I said to him was, I said, Brother, God told me within one year we're going to have 100 people. And he came after a year. We had an annual business meeting. Because the church got every year you have to have an annual business meeting. The overseer has to be there. He came for our annual business meeting. And he looked at our congregation and he said, Your pastor told me after, he said, within one year you'd have 100 people. He said, that has been done. I can testify and I can, I can assert that that is a fact. He said, but I'm going to tell you right now, y'all keep going. He said, I dare say in the, in the next year you'll have 200. He said, I've never seen a church grow like this. I'll tell you one reason we grew. I was a kid. You know how easy it would have been for people to look at me and question my authority? You know how easy it would have been for people to look at me and question my wisdom and my leadership abilities and what have you? But you know what, Jack? I operated in the authority of the Holy Ghost. I operated in the authority God gave me. Even, I'll never forget it, even in my first church. Because I knew that that's what God expects when you get in that pulpit. Don't you dare mealy mouth and mousy lead God's people. Don't you dare let the enemy come in and destroy the flock of God. Don't you dare leave the sheep of God's pasture without a guard and a shepherd to protect them. You have been called to an office. You stand in that office. That includes the authority of the Holy Ghost. That's why when I pray before I preach, <coughs> do I not almost always say, Lord, help me to preach with the authority of the Holy Ghost. I need you to, if I'm going to mealy mouth, if, if I'm going to step back from it, you help me, Lord, to stand in that authority that you've called me to stand in. Because those who are in a position, a mastering position, will be held to a greater condemnation. Meaning simply, they will be held to a much higher standard. Alright, amen. So we got through verse 1. Verse 2. I dare say we're not going to get past verse 3 today. For in many things we offend all. It is not uncommon for a man of God or woman of God, someone who is in God-called, God-anointed ministry, it is not uncommon for them to offend folk. You know, Lincoln said you can fool some of the people all the time, all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Well, in the church, it's, you can offend some of the people some of the time, all the, all the people some of the time, some of the people all the time, but you can't offend them all all the time. And that really is true. You don't offend every word that comes out of your mouth, but chances are somewhere along the line, something you say <laughs> is going to offend everybody at one point or another. Especially if you operate in the authority God has given you you better believe people are going to get offended. I've had pastors say things that offended me deeply. I didn't run out of the church crying. I didn't go looking for another church. I didn't go talking about him behind his back. You know why? Because I respected the authority. God get that man. I did. My Bible said, submit yourself to those that are over you in the Lord. That's my responsibility to submit myself to this man. I know Jack, he didn't say what he said to hurt my feelings. I know he didn't say it to ruin my life. He said it to help me. Even though it was hard for me to hear. I know the man's motivation is not to destroy me. But James said, for in some, in many things, we offend all. 
He said, there's a lot of times everybody's offended. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and, all, and able also to bridle the whole body. James says, if there's anybody out there that cannot offend the soul, then honey, you found Jesus. You found the perfect guy. Because you would literally have to be perfect beyond measure to be able to speak and not offend somebody. Be able to lead and not offend somebody. To be able to direct and guide and counsel and not offend somebody. He said, that'd be a perfect guy. Verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Verse 4, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Verse 5, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little, a little fire kindleth. I want to point something out to you. James is talking about how the tongue is just a little part of the body, but it sure can create some big problems. Notice that within the context of these last three verses, he's not speaking of others. He's speaking of himself or an editorial us. Who? The masters. The leaders. He said, for in many ways we offend all. Then he turns around and says, behold the tongue. He's talking about leaders and he's saying, the tongue is a little thing, but it causes such great problems. He's saying, folks, you've got to understand that leader is as human as you are. That leader's got the same issues you've got. That leader's got the same humanity that you wrestle with. That little tongue can sometimes say things you need to hear that will offend you. And sometimes, bless God, I just say the wrong stupid thing and offend. And I admit that. Because I'm as human as anybody in the room. And James is saying, so far he's talking about, he's still within the context of the leaders. The masters. And he's saying, you know, the tongue is a little thing, but bless God, it sure can put the ship. It's like it's like the runner on the ship. It sure can set the course wrong or right, depending on which way it goes. Leaders have that issue to deal with. As a pastor, that's one reason why a lot of times when I'm preaching, I wrestle with whether I should even say certain things. And I literally wrestle. There are times the Holy Ghost drops something in my spirit and I say, Lord, is that you? I want to make sure that's you. Because Lord, I just know somebody's going to have a fit over this. I've got to be sure it's you because I sure don't want to say this and it's just some little thought popped into my head. If there's anybody in the church that needs desperately to guard how they say what they say, it's the guy at the top of the heap. I've known preachers that were so careless about the way they said things, they offended everybody all the time. <laughs> Had a pastor when I was a kid in the Assemblies God. He was a good man, and I love him, and I'm not by any means speaking ill of him. But he had the worst habit of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time without fail. And people were offended by this man every time he turned his head. Because he just, you know, just, he, he meant well, but it sure enough didn't come across in the way he said things. This is one reason why I have to insist, as I have so many times, 
The Word of God tells us how to respond to offense when we are offended. Go to that person. S settle the matter. Straighten it out. Folks, if you think I'm not ever going to say something that might offend you, you're out of your tree. Now you can either be foolish and let the enemy drive you out of the will of God, push you out of a place where you, God may want you to be, because as imperfect and as human as this preacher is, this still may be the church God wants you in. You can either let the enemy cheat you and rob you. We've had people come to this church and God's blessed them and helped them and blessed them and helped them. And then they got offended over one little stupid thing and out the door they run. And you know what? The enemy laughs. Ha! I got you out of a Jesus name, one God apostolic church. I got you out of a church preaches Acts 2.38. Now you're going down the street to a church that preaches what the Baptist church preaches. And these people don't have enough sense in their head or enough love of the truth to recognize the difference. There are going to be times the leadership's going to say things, and we need to respond to that biblically. Go to them. Settle the matter. I'm not above apologizing. I'm not above clarifying. Especially when people respond to something secondhand. Well, don't you know, Brother Charles said, Brother, and I might not have said that at all. I'll never forget the girl I married. Her mother had a habit. She could hear somebody say something and repeat it to somebody else. And what I heard that person say and what I heard come out of my mother-in-law's mouth were not the same. The words were the same. But the connotation was very different. Well, Brother Hill asked, where's Chuck this morning? Brother Hill may simply have said, where's Chuck this morning? You see what I'm saying? She didn't change the words, but she sure changed the inflection. She and you know what? There are people, brother, who will lose out with God who will forfeit their salvation, who will backslide and be out of church, who will give up on the church, who will turn on the pastor, all because of second hand, something they're fed. And the enemy knows how to get it to you, so it's going to hit you the wrong way. That person might very well be repeating word for word what he said, but what they might not be doing is repeating it the same way you said it. That's right. You're saying the same words, Jack says, but not the same message. Amen. You follow what I'm saying? That's why it's so important that we respond, especially to leadership, when there's an issue of offense. You know, it's so important that we respond in a biblical fashion. All right. Verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Notice now, James widens the scope. No longer is he merely referring to the leadership, he said, of our members. Now he's including the hearers. Now he's including those he's writing to. All right. He said, the tongue said, honey, let me tell you. <laughs> and he paints an awful picture of what the tongue is capable of. He said, man, this thing is a match that can set a whole forest ablaze. You know, we used to sing a song years ago when I was young in the church growing up. It said, it only takes a spark. Get a fire going. You don't gotta, you don't gotta set a fire this big to wind up with a fire this big. You don't have to set a whole, you know, ship on fire 
to wind up with a fire as big as a ship. If you follow what I'm saying. All you got to do is get a little piece of that bugger burning. And eventually the whole thing will be engulfed. And this is what James speaks of. He says, the tongue is a fire. So, honey, sometimes all it takes is the littlest start. And it can turn into something enormous. It can, you can start with what is merely a wild spark. And before it's over, it's become a forest fire. He said, verse 7, For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. You got men in the Middle East who can sit there with a flute and they can charm a snake. One of the most poisonous, venomous, dangerous snakes in the world, the cobra. You got people, Jack, that can handle them things and mess with them, and that thing could kill them in any minute. And yet they're able to interact with it. And they're able to do with it what they will, and that thing doesn't hurt them. James says, there's not a kind of fish, any kind of animal, any kind of serpent, any kind of bird that man hasn't been able to tame. Some of the most dangerous birds in the world, hawks and eagles. There are men who train these animals and they use them in movies. Yeah, use them to hunt. He said, he said, here you've got some of the wildest things that only know how to operate on instinct. And yet human beings are able to tame them and train them to do their bidding. He said, but the tongue, that's a whole different ball of wax. That's a whole different ball of wax. Because your tongue is tied not only to your brain, honey, it is tied to your emotions. Dare I say, hello, it's tied to your past. It's tied to the condition of your heart. It's tied to what's going on in your life today. You know, you say the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time, and oh boy, howdy, are you going to get lashed. Yet, you might could say that identical same thing to the identical same person on a different day, and it all would be well. They're having a bad day. Their experience today had not been good. And all of a sudden, that one thing you say to them today, because that old tongue is tied to so many extenuating factors. There are so many things that contribute to what comes off of the tongue. And this is why James said, man, we can tame animals, we can tame birds, we can tame, but dear God, help us. Nobody can tame the tongue. And he said, nobody, brother. So don't be surprised when you slip and say some stupid things sometimes. Don't be surprised. Nobody. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith, bless we God, even the Father... And therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Let me make the point here. And i got to put a little oneness teaching in here. This idea, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, is a pile of manure. When you speak the term God in Scripture without exception, God... G-O-D, and the Father are one and the same. When you refer to God, James uses the language, look, even the Father. In other words, God is automatically the Father. The Father is automatically God. Those two words literally are synonymous. They mean one and the same thing. If God were comprised of a father 
a Son, and a Holy Ghost, then the term God would not be synonymous specifically with the Father. You following what I'm trying to say? I'll give you an example in modern time. We're almost done tonight. About another ten minutes I got, roughly. If you live in New York City, there are five boroughs in New York City. You've got Staten Island, Queens, Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan. However, if you address a letter to so-and-so, such-and-such, New York, New York, all five of those boroughs constitute New York City. But if you address an envelope to New York, New York, that is a Manhattan address. It will not go to one of the other boroughs. When you say New York, New York, automatically New York and Manhattan are synonymous. If you write a letter to somebody in Brooklyn, it better say Brooklyn, New York. If you write to somebody in Staten Island, it better say Staten Island, New York. If you write to somebody in the Bronx, it better say the Bronx, New York. But watch this. When you get to Queens, it really gets complicated because now it goes by neighborhood. You get to Queens and all of a sudden it's St. Albans, New York. That's one neighborhood in Queens. And you break it down by neighborhood. You see, when you say New York, New York, you're automatically speaking of Manhattan. When you say God, you are immediately inferring the Father. You can search this out all you want to. And you will find that not one time ever in the New Testament teaching is the term Father not married to the term God and the term God not married to the term Father. That's why you never read the words God the Holy Ghost and God the Son. This is why, oh hallelujah, told you I got to punch a little oneness in there. This is why when Jesus said, I and my Father are one, He was declaring Himself to be God. Because to say the Father, He was not merely saying the third person of the Trinity and I are part of the same bunch. No. He said, I and the Father, God, are one. Hallelujah. All right, that's freebie. Y'all don't have to pay for that. Therefore, therewith, bless we God, even the Father. By the way, I've talked about this in the past. The term here that is translated in the King James, even, even the Father. This word is translated from the Greek word kai, K-A-I. This term can be translated one of two ways. It can be translated as and, A-N-D, or it can be translated as even. When you read many passages in Scripture which try to elude by reason of the language of King James era to three persons of God because it says this and this and this and many people immediately read that and say, see right there? There are three separate. That same passage could read the Father, even the Son, even the Holy Ghost. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, even of the Son, even of the Holy Ghost, which immediately says something very different. That says that the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is all one name. That's right, amen. But see... By it saying in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, it's still saying one name. But the problem is, you have a Trinitarian bias, you read it with that Trinitarian bias. And all of a sudden, to you, it's saying these are three separate people with three separate names. And that is not the case. The same term that is translated and can also be translated even. It is at the discretion of the translator 
as to which direction they go in. But when you understand the Word of God in its entirety, when you understand the whole of it, we know who Jesus is. And therefore we know that in most instances, you're far better off going with even than ain't. Uh -huh. yes, amen. Hallelujah. Woo! God, a prince middle oneness around here. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Therewith bless we God, even the Father. I, I, I can't get off this one, this kid. Hold on a minute. I can't do it. I can't do it yet. There are many times in Scripture where it will read, in this instance, I'm going to change the even to an and. Therefore, bless we God and the Father. How many times do you read in the Word of God where it will say God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, wait a minute. God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. If and implies in addition to, then that means our Lord Jesus Christ has a God and He has a Father. See, folk love to get caught up in language. They love to get all twisted because of the way something's worded. Folks, this isn't hard to get. If that same passage read like this does, God, even the Father, we'd have no issue. We would not be, there'd be no room for confusion. And yet the same identical word is translated both ways. And yet for that one little three-letter word, people believe all kinds of false ideas about God and who God is. So it's important sometimes, you know the old saying, the devil's in the details? Uh -huh. <laughs> it's important to know some of the little things. Out of the same mouth, I swear I won't get through this. <laughs> Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. Verse 10. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. It can if it's polluted for a time. You can have a well that's fresh water and then all of a sudden you take water up out of that well and it can kill you. Because something got into the well that didn't belong there. Well children, that's how we that's how we talk. There are times we let our mouths put things out because we let something in. Hello now. There are times when we allow something to come out because we let something in. The Word of God said, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So when the mouth is speaking for cursing rather than blessing, we've let something in that we ought not to have let in. Bitterness, anger, malice, what? What is something? There's something there. And when you understand that, then... We are able to focus on the right thing rather than... See, a lot of people try to focus on what comes out. Yeah, that's right. Try to focus on what you let in. Yes, amen. Try to keep your will from being polluted. Yes, Lord, I don't want to cuss and scream and holler and yell and carry on like a fool. And in order for me not to do that, I don't need better control of my mouth. I need better control of what I let into my spirit. Amen. I need better control of what I let into my heart. I need to get, there's something inside of me that manifests itself when certain things happen or things happen a certain way. And I need to get victory over that. Because if I can get victory over that, then only pure water will come forth. Only clean water will come forth. Only blessing will come forth. Follow? Hallelujah. Woo, we got some good teaching around the one church. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Well, I think we did it. We made it through the first part. Yeah. <laughs> we made it through the first part anyway. This is the final chapter of James. There's just three chapters. Isn't there? 
the, oh, I'm sorry, I saw the last slide and I forgot I have each chapter's on a different set of slides. There are five chapters. This is, next week will be the final part of chapter three. Okay, so we'll finish chapter three next Tuesday, then we'll move into chapter four, that's why I knew that. Why in the world did I say that? See what I mean about how dumb the tongue can be. Amen. So, uh, did you get something out of that tonight? Amen. Isn't God good? I'm telling you, the Word of God is wonderful. It is precious. When you know, the, like Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Honey, when you know the truth about the Word of God, it is not anything to fear. It is something to celebrate. It is something to rejoice and joy in. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight?